What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Melody Cherie, and you are listening to Black Men Sundays. It's a Black Man Sunday. Time to put all childish things away. I refuse to be the man I was yesterday. Gotta put my best foot forward and elevate. What's going on, everybody? This is Black Men Sundays. I'm your host, Corey Sylvester Murray. We're talking about generational wealth. We're talking about finance. And of course, we're talking about business. And before we introduce today's guest, my brother Eric from Huntsville, Alabama, who do you have for our Black Men Sunday Spotlight? Hey, thanks a lot, Corey, for that introduction. Hey, I got a story for you. This is about two Black kings who turned a barbershop into a $750 million software company. Now, this story is truly inspiring. Now, these are two brothers, Solange LaRon and Dave Sauber. They left their desk jobs behind to create a booking software for the nation's 109,000 barbershops. Let me tell you a little bit something about this. These two guys turned a barbershop, like I said, into a $750 million software company. Basically what they did, these two guys met at a party and they were joined each other of their drives to succeed. So in 2015, they quit their corporate jobs to bring an idea to barbershops and they called them Square, Start Square because they binge watch Game of Thrones together every Sunday. The idea was simple, an online reservation system for barbershop just like the restaurants. So the co-founders spread the word in scrappy ways once they started to move and tag in popular location in Manhattan with the words Download Square. Then the founders made their big game, paying $200,000 to lease a barbershop. So they understood the business, run a real barbershop, and they gave them some depth insights on how to start and design Square. And then they got rejected by some three times by other uh, investors. So Bill came in securing some money for themselves and started to open a $28,000, 28000 bottle shop, which valued into $750 million. And now they have grossed up to a $1 billion shop by the software invention of just booking their haircuts. That's my spotlight for today. Now back to you, Corey. Oh, man, that's what I'm talking about, Eric. I'll be loving them spotlights. You know, I always ask you, how's it how's it going in Huntsville? So what's going on in Hunts Vegas today, brother? Yeah, you see, right? Oh, we doing it like it's, that. I see that. Yeah, we doing what it is like that? that? That's the wrong A&M because I thought Florida A&M. When I ask people. Oh, oh, this is something else I want to tell you. I guess, you know, I got brains because we're talking about A&M real quick. Uh, we made history with enrollment. We have now over 2,000 freshmen to enroll at A&M this semester. With that being said, we have 200 plus just freshman band members. So when we play y'all, uh, FAMU, um, I mean, those FAMU, uh, what do you call it? Rat snake, chicken snakes, whatever they call, y'all better be ready. It's called the marching 100, man. We have 100. No, that's about you. Well, y'all about the marching 50 now. So we're going to be the marching 300. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hear that, man. I hear that. Yeah, I see. I see how you're doing because normally you on here by yourself talking about Alabama A and M. Now you have our guest representing the school with you. So now I see you, but I appreciate that. Thanks for that spotlight, right. my brother. Thank you. Let's go on to introduce today's guest. I'm trying to see where should I begin. Well, you know, I'm I'm gonna start with with some breaking news. In August of 23, this sister's the first reality star to own her own network, Nubian. This sister also owns a production company, Tilted Crowns Productions. This sister also has a real estate and design business, Melody S. Holt Incorporated. Come on, this Black Men Sundays. We're bigging up our sisters. It's August. We celebrate Black Business Month. But nah, on Black Men Sundays, we're celebrating our sisters. We're closing out August. We have Melody Cherie coming through, Black Men Sundays. Yeah, you heard me. She's the star of the own show, you know, the Oprah Winfrey Network. The Love and Marriage Huntsville. She the star on that show. But without further ado, Melody Cherie, welcome to Black Men Sunday, sister. How you hey, doing? hey, hey. Hi, how are you all doing? So happy yeah. to be here. <laughs> Definitely. Welcome to Black Men Sundays. And you know, our show is about generational wealth, finance, and business. So I'm going to just cut to the chase and get right down to the dollar signs, get right down to it. You know, when I think of Black people, when it comes to land ownership, I feel like we're deeply systematically um there's systematically entrenched barriers that keep us from participating in generational wealth so these days with the high interest rates and the high cost of home ownership how can we make sure that black men and black women are really utilizing the largest asset which is home ownership and making sure that we're using that to create generational wealth 
Well, so I purchased my first property actually um, in 2009 and I was 23. Um, and so I knew out the gate that it was important to have, you know, home ownership and land ownership, you know, after that, of course, I also have a home builder's license. So I also, you know, started building property. Um, I also purchased commercial real estate um, that, you know, was really held on to because recognizing right where there is a rise um, in value and getting properties in those areas, um, foreseeing, so to speak, right, what's coming and what's happening. That's why it's important for you to to be involved when it comes to your chamber of commerce, when it comes to being connected to local organizations so that you know what industries are coming, so you know where to purchase your property. Location, location, location is always key. So I would advise anyone, um, whenever you're looking at home ownership, land ownership, make sure you are doing your research, make sure you are getting properties um, in prime areas where the value is going to go up. So that way you will be able to see a profit um, when you decide to sell and maybe invest elsewhere. Definitely. But given the way the market is now, a lot of um, investors, especially the ones that I speak with in our community that are homeowners that may own multiple properties, they tell me the problem that they have is five years ago, you know, the rates were low, the prices were a little high, but they were able to, you know, close the deal because the rate was low. But now, you know, you're basically getting a home that was worth 200,000. You're basically paying uh, almost $600,000 with the, you know, the insurance, especially in the state of Florida, because we're in Florida here, you know, when, when, you know, when we're talking about the, uh, the, the home insurance, in addition to the interest rate. So how can we keep our brothers and sisters investing and believing in real estate because i feel like you know we had a guest last week when we were talking about crypto and you know due, due to the volatility um of crypto you know a lot of brothers don't aren't really using it as much but nowadays you know i feel like real estate is such a great asset class like what can we do as black men and women that we're not afraid to step into this marketplace even though we know we're buying high like, because, you know, no one ever says, OK, you're buying high, but we don't know what the ceiling is. So, you know, what would you say to that? You have to know the market. First of all, there's a cycle that happens in when it comes to the economy. One moment, interest rates are high. Typically, when they're high, you don't buy as much. That's kind of what you don't do. You just don't buy as much when the rates are high. And then you wait for those rates to drop. And then that's when you see an influx of people buying property. Um, so, you know, me having been in the market dealing with property preservation, which is foreclosures, right? Um, I was privy to seeing all the homes that were foreclosed on because when rates were high, people were buying and they were buying in an adjustable rate so that they could get a certain rate at that time that eventually would go up. And then they end up, I can't afford this mortgage, so I'm letting the house go back, right? Then my company would go out and do the lock changes and the grass cuts for the banks and the repairs for the bank so they could resell the home. So I would encourage anyone when the rates are high, don't buy as much. I'm not saying don't buy because if you got a stellar deal where it makes sense for you to get the property and you know you're going to be able to make a great profit on it despite the interest rate, then, hey, take the leap and go for it. But if you can hold, you got to know when to hold them, when to fold them. If you can hold for a minute, wait till those rates come back down because they're going to come back down. The cycle always repeats itself. Then that's what you do. Wow. Don't be too anxious for anything. Don't be too anxious for anything. I, I will tell anyone, everything that is meant for you to have it when you're supposed to have it, the way you're supposed to have it, you're going to have it. Okay. I literally, to be honest with you, I just had to purchase a large, very large purchase that I was going to make last week. Wire the money and everything, right? Now, when the paperwork came over, I ain't going to lie, I kind of looked at the interest rate and I was kind of feeling like, mm, no, I'm feeling like right right here you know what i end up doing i said uh-uh send me my money back i changed my mind i'm gonna wait you know like you gotta know when to wait and um you know i thought about the seller i was like man they probably feel like dang because they knew they just had this sale done or whatever but no nah, it's okay sometimes to sit still and wait for things to be the way they need to be that makes sense don't ever make a decision and do something that doesn't make sense Wow, great, great information. And also noticed, um, looking at your press kit, you have a real estate masterclass, masterclass with Melody. What are we going to learn from that? You know, like what's the like what's the value of 
buying that. Absolutely. So my masterclass is five weeks. I actually teach it myself. So they get one, my students get one-on-one -on -one access to me. Um, I've created over 700 entrepreneurs since June of 2020. Um, people who've gone through my course, we walk them through the process of getting that EIN, creating that LLC and getting them into this multi-billion dollar industry called property preservation. So I had, it's a national industry because foreclosures is national, right? So I have students from all over and I come in and I give them the tools to success when it comes to being in this industry that has been a white male dominated industry for so long. We're used to, and we all are familiar with buying properties, fixing them up, putting money in them for what we think someone will want and will want to buy it. Not sure, but we're hoping, hopefully someone likes this landscape. Hopefully someone likes this color, right? But we really don't know for sure. And we put all this money in, we put the house on the market and we're hoping and praying it's going to sell. Well, with property preservation, it doesn't work like that. You're literally going in doing what the bank asks you to do and you get paid for that. You don't have to worry about if that property sells. I've had foreclosures that I've you know, worked on for three, four years. Um, and so when you talk about a quick return on your money, um, property preservation, if you're looking at real estate, property preservation is definitely one of those key avenues. And as you know, I'm sure, you know, multiple streams of income in this day and age is where it's at. I've had students who've resigned from their nine to fives who are not only now doing property preservation, but because I introduced them to that, they're also they have lawn contracts for hotels for an entire state. I have some students who are doing property management for apartments as well now, not just um, single family dwellings for banks. So your resume becomes to the point where it can expand, but the basis was right here with me, property preservation. And let's talk about your real estate design business. Cause you know, when I think about like design, I'm thinking like, okay, if I want like, a his and her tub, a his and her shower, then I might want something in the middle. Like, is that the kind of design we're talking about? Like, break it down to so, us. Yeah, absolutely. So I actually um, got my home builder's license in 2016. And the way I got into that, to be honest with you, is um, it started, I say everything you do in life should be a stepping block into something else. So I was doing foreclosure activity, property preservation for the banks. And it got to the point where sometimes foreclosures would be fire damaged, storm damaged, hail damaged. And it was like, hey, Melody, can y'all go demo this house and rebuild it? Because, of course, the bank has the insurance proceeds. And so I had never built a house before a day in my life. And I was like, how much you say they work on this for? 122K. Oh, OK. And this was back in like maybe 2013, 14. Right. And I was like, oh, man, I ain't never did it, but I'm about to learn how. And so it started there. Like I started, you know, um, building for the banks. And then I, you know, eventually first I was working under someone's contract. Um, his name is Gordon out of Birmingham. Then after that, I went and got my own home builder's license. And so when it comes to sitting down with clients and sitting down, going over their idea of design, um, making sure that what they visualize is what we bring to reality. That's what I do. And that's what I've done. Um, you know, I, I have a, I have a, I'm a stickler for one for things being very neat and looking really clean. So I love your whites and your grays and, you know, your clean chic type look. And so, um, you know, I, I home building, um, I got into that in 2016 and that's kind of when I started getting into more of the design piece of it. <laughs> oh, wow. When I say you lit, you you got the whole city lit. And keep in mind, they are, you know, here, they are here for y'all. Come on now. Nah, I know nah, y'all are popping every Sunday. No, nah, well, you know, you know, we do our thing. That's, you know, that's why you are <laughs> here. Because, you know, I didn't, I didn't know who we are. You know, we that's cool right. over there. Definitely. Right. <laughs> so before, before we transition, you know, you did bring up a yeah. point, you know, you, you brought up uh, the fixer up right here. A lot of brothers nowadays saying, you know, I'm going to try to get a duplex. I'm going to try to get a storage facility. I'm going to try to get a fixer upper or just something where they're going to have to spend money. But then a lot of brothers tell me, listen, man, why should I invest this money, pay for this, you know, pay taxes on it every year? And now, now I have to spend a couple hundred thousand to get it. So a lot of brothers, I feel like leave deals on the table. Like, what do you say about that? Those may be the people who need to come check out property preservation. Because, see, we don't deal with all of that in property preservation. We don't have to worry about the taxes on the home. We don't have to worry about 
pouring all this money into the property to try to get it to sell. Your fits are upwards, as you say. That is why I have been pushing and giving the knowledge to my audience of what property preservation is and what it entails because we literally don't have to think about that. We literally don't care if the house sells or not. It doesn't matter. When that bank gives me my work order and I do whatever it is they want done, I'm getting a check for that in seven to 30 days. Seven to 30 days, I'm getting a check for my work. It don't matter if it sits on the market for two more years. So that is why I've been trying to tell people about property preservation. You blowing me away right now. Wow. You know, so I ain't gonna lie, the wife had me look at a couple of the shows because I was like, babe, you know who she is? My mom was like, you know who she is? My mom was like, yeah. My mom on the call <laughs> listening, by the way. She ain't gonna stay. Oh, hey, mom. Yeah, hey, I got my buddy. wife. Yeah, my <laughs> wife on here. They they big fans of yours, big fans oh, of yours. So yeah, much. so I had I had to make sure, you know, because I'm coming through, you know, I like to talk money. I love it. Like, it just nothing makes me happier than Christmas, my birthday, and talking money, you know. Oh, but, yeah. I, but I kind of want to backtrack real quick because my brother Eric, you know, he went to Alabama A&M University. <laughs> and I see you have a Bachelor of Science in English Language Arts. Yeah. So, and I see you started out, you were a middle school teacher. So I, how yeah. did you transition to getting all this real estate and all this money. Man, what's so crazy? Wow. Like I was literally, and let me say this, I still love teaching. And as you see, I do that now by way of my class, but I'm teaching adults versus middle schoolers, right? Um, but I love teaching, but I knew that for the level of living that I desired and the level of giving that I desired to be able to do, that that income alone wasn't going to do it, right? We all know that teachers don't get paid what they yeah. should be getting paid. And that's very true. Um, and so I started, you know, bringing in supplemental type income from having a lawn company, um, a cleaning company, cleaning offices and, you know, professional spaces. Um, and then from there, I learned about property preservation and HUD and what that looks like when it comes into, you know, dealing with foreclosures. And I literally I was able to resign after I got into business. I resigned from teaching about four months later and went full time as an entrepreneur, um, turned it into a million dollar company by 25, multi-million by 28. So, um, you know, I went head in and I was focused, laser, laser tunnel vision. Um, and I knew, like I said, for the level of living I wanted and the level of giving that I wanted, I knew that I had to do more and that there had to be more. And not only did I just think about it, though, I got out there and put the work in with it. Like I still have pictures of me out pushing lawnmowers before I was able to afford a riding mower. You get what I'm saying? Like I still have that. I have pictures of me in these dirty foreclosed properties, me cleaning them myself, you know? Um, so I put the work in to make sure I'm meeting my clients' deadlines, make sure I'm delivering a quality product because there's nothing bigger than your name. When you establish your name, when you establish your brand, right, to be of a certain level, a certain caliber, the work will come to you. So at one point, I was doing seven states, by, you know, in property preservation at one time. And I expanded to all those states because my business name had gotten a reputation in the industry for, hey, they get work done. Their work gets done on time. Their work is done with a high quality, high level quality of work. And so um, I worked, but I got, I had my feet, I was the boots on the ground. My feet were on the ground, getting in there, getting work done, establishing, you know, that good reputation. Definitely. You know, it's Black Men's Sundays, but when I look at my analytics, it's like 51% women listening to our show between the ages of 35 and 44. And I was talking to my brother Kalali and I was like, man. It's Black Men Sundays, but the sisters listening. He said, come on, man. You know, the sisters always been ahead of us. They've all, they grew up a little, you know, that we're the same age, but they always matured earlier than we did. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, but but because of that, now the brothers are listening. But for our sisters out here that own businesses, but, you know, they feel like, you know, I've been in my business for three to four years. I'm not really making a lot of money. I feel like I'm paying more. I'm investing more than I'm making. Like what? advice would you give our sisters out here? So anytime you start something in the beginning, it is an investment, right? 
um, how quickly how quickly that return on investment or ROI happens um, varies. But what I will say is whenever you get to a point after a few years, it should be to a point where, OK, I am starting to see if not sooner, because I have students who pay the 3K for my master class and they make that on their first work order they get from the bank. So they've already gotten an ROI and now they have this knowledge for forever to pass down to their children, to their grandchildren. Once you know the game, you know the game. Right. Um, but after a few years, you should be seeing, you know, a return on your investment, whatever that looked like. And sometimes you have to allow yourself to think outside the box. Like what other areas can you expand into? What branches can you pull from maybe what that foundation, now that that foundation is solid, you know, the foundation in and out. What are some other things that you can expand into? Remember, I told you some of my students come in and learn property preservation, but I've got students now who have contracts for hotels for the whole state, for that whole state. They, they the lawn. They do the lawn for all the hotels for the state where they're running, managing apartments. Well, that's not what I taught them. I taught them property preservation, but once they got property preservation unlocked, they started expanding out so that they could bring in even more income. So you have to be willing to think, where is there a place where there is a demand and maybe not as much of a supply that I can tap into and I can bring my gifts and my resources into and get to the, get, you know, to the books. How, where, where is that? And so you have to sit back um, and, and have a network of people around you. Um, who are also, you know, able to, you're able to talk things through with them and maybe they're able to throw you ideas. Well, hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Right? So you got to have people around you that you can also talk to and be transparent and be honest. Girl, look, I've been doing this for four years. My money ain't coming in like I needed to. What do you think I could do? Do you, what's some other things you think other directions I can go with this? Like you got to have that solid core group too um, of accountability partners and friends, right? Who are able to help you get to the next level too, just by simply sharing ideas and talking to them. Oh, I'm loving this conversation. I'm getting educated like crazy today. So you're the owner of the uh, production company, Tilted Crowns Production. Yeah. Like what was the impetus for even creating that? Yeah, so, you know, um, of course, you know, everyone probably knows, you know, I pitched Love and Marriage Huntsville some years ago, and now it's the number one show on the Oprah Winfrey Network, right, a national network, international, actually, and um, just being a producer with Love and Marriage Huntsville, um, knowing what it takes being in front of the camera, right, by being on the cast, but then back to what I said, you got to always think, what else, what else, what else, don't ever just let yourself be in a standstill, so even though I'm in front of the camera on this show, also doing producing behind the scenes too, what else is there for me to do, what else can I tap into, and one day my manager and I was talking, she's been in the entertainment industry for over 30 years, we were talking, and we talked about how as women, right? Different things we just go through a lot of times as women and how that crown gets tilted, you know, and you got to have a sister or a friend or a brother who's there to help you tilt that crown back up. You know what I'm saying? Like fix your crown. Like I know you're going through some things, baby girl, but it's time to fix your crown. And those were conversations my manager would have with me because I was going through my very public divorce. Um, so the times and moments when I felt weak, she was like, uh-uh, fix your crown. So that's how Tilted Crowns Productions came about, um, you know, and so what we're doing now is we're helping, I'm not going to say the underdogs, but the people who maybe never thought they'd be on TV, but it was a dream for them, right? Helping them get their ideas and putting them on networks and putting them on TV. You mentioned earlier, you know, I am co-owner of Nubian TV. Um, and so the floodgates are open for me. Any show I want to take there, I can take there, right? Um, and so it's all been very strategic very strategic i'm looking at the network nubian black men sundays that kind of rings some bells right there we might have to do some talking i had to hit ivan and we're gonna have to do some connecting so speaking of Absolutely. other yeah so definitely so speaking of other business ventures i see you have a seventh avenue beauty or skincare line talk, talk about that a little bit so i started working on my skincare line uh, maybe 2018 but as a child i suffered from a skin condition called pityriasis rosacea so um, every time the fall would come around, I would get these dry patches. It would start on my back and spread. And so my great grandmother actually gave me a remedy 
to help with the scaling and the itching, right? And so um, I, I use some of that in my skincare line, brought that information to my chemist. I actually have a chemist. And I tell people all the time, anything you do, want to be the best at whatever you do. I don't care what it is. I don't care if you're selling hot dogs. You be the best hot dog seller there is, okay? So for me, um, you know, being in the beauty industry, you have people all the time buying products from China and throwing a label on them. They don't really know what's in it. They don't really know the, you know, the facility in which it was made, if it's clean or not. I have a chemist out of Texas who I've been working with. She's been a chemist for 19 years. Um, I go to her facility anytime I want to. I was just there last week, right, to make sure that we're, you know, moving the we're in sync with each other, with what the product should be. Um, and so my skincare line, man, just the fact that, um, you know, it's dear to me because I did suffer from a condition that I know how to get it to where it needs to be skin wise. Right. And then working with a chemist who's won all types of awards um, just for her abilities and her talents. It's been amazing putting together this skincare line that are making our women feel beautiful. Of course, we work on the inside, but also on the outside, too. And before I open up, because, you know, Black Men Sundays, it's not just me. Um, answering all, asking all the questions. I let some of the brothers and sisters on here engage as well. That's what makes us unique. That's why you on here as well, because I want I want some of the brothers and sisters to be able to engage with you. So, okay. but be, but before I do that, um, we talked about you know on our on our show we talked about a brother came on talked about seven streams of income. You mentioned streams of income, so you know I mean a lot of brothers when they think of streams of income off top they think of their day job. They think of their house, if they have a rental property. But then it's like after that third stream, we all be kind of like, yeah, like, you know, when I'm like, you know, I got four because I, I got like some shoes worth like four five thousand dollars a piece that's matured over time. I kind of I kind of did the traditional stock black men edition version. You know what I'm saying? Selling selling Jordans and all that. But I mean, outside of those four streams. We're kind of like at a loss. So, you know, from your perspective, you know, yeah. you're a millionaire and you're doing that. So when we talk about seven streams of income, like what are we not even thinking about? Well, um, a few things. Um, one thing that people love to pay for is knowledge. So, you know, I share with you how I, how I have my class. If you look at what am I an expert in? What is it that I know information in like the back of my hand and I know this thing in and out and I can teach somebody else. Now, let me package that up in a way where I can sell that knowledge, right? Your intellectual property, okay? So that's one thing that you gotta look out for. Another thing is e-commerce. So I just got into e-commerce by way of my 7th Avenue skincare line, but I also have a merch line where I said, um, I have this um, brand, God Said Go. So I sell sweatshirts, hoodies, t-shirts, uh, fanny packs, but e-commerce, finding things that you can sell to the general public that's affordable. That's another thing. So what is it that you could be making and selling? So I just gave you two more right there. Since we were talking about a uh, uh, real estate, I'm going to start out with, a, with this question. How do you um usually pick like prime sites or prime properties, like the ones that will appreciate be, uh, in value the best? Uh, what's your strategy on, on going about selecting those properties? Absolutely. So I'll give you um, one of the commercial properties that I purchased years, 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 years ago. Um, whenever we purchased this particular property, it's, it was commercial and it was across from Bridge Street, which is Bridge Street. Like I said, this goes back to being a part of the conversations happening where you're at Chamber of Commerce. Um, I was a member of the Women's Economic Development Council. I was a board member on the Chamber of Commerce. So I knew the different things that were coming. Bridge Street, we knew was about to be popping and jumping. So we bought a piece of commercial real estate across from Bridge Street. You know what I'm saying? Um, so the key is being in the know. Being in the know, you can't just go to your job and come home and not interact and network with the movers and shakers of your city and think you're going to know where you need to be investing in buying property and where, where things are about to be popping in a few years. You know what I'm saying? So you've got to use some time to, to be involved with those different governmental type agencies and organizations so that you can, um, so that you can know and be in the know of what's going on. So I knew when Facebook was coming to Huntsville, I knew um, when there were different, like the Toyota and all the different expansions, I knew when those things were coming and where they were going to be because I kept myself involved in those organizations to be in the know. That's definitely a gem. You already, you've already dropped so many gems on me. I'm, I'm going to get uh, start looking into uh, uh, property preservation myself because I was looking at real come estate. On, come on. 
I didn't I didn't even know that was a thing like until today until like right now so I'm about to like really start studying that so that's so yeah. you just keep dropping the gems right now um what uh, what I'll say is we don't get a chance a lot to talk on this show which we probably should do more but we don't get a lot of chance to talk about branding a lot and you were talking about branding and brand management you mentioned that a little bit um so I just like you to go into that a little bit how do how important is brand management um, to what you do and how do we go about identifying what our brand actually is and making sure our brand stays on point? Absolutely. So, you know, for me, of course, I am a walking billboard for my brand, right? No, um, sure. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's super important for me, you know, that I am always moving in every decision I make in every, every place I go, that I am moving in a way that represents who I am and also what I stand for. So, you know, I've had opportunities and deals come to the table that look good monetarily, but it didn't align with my brand. So you also have to be okay with saying no to things that don't align with your brand. And where that one possibility came from or opportunity came from, I guarantee you there will be another opportunity um, that will come your way. So I've been able to keep my brand pretty much pertaining to me outside of the divorce and all the scandal that went with that, but pertaining strictly to me, a clean brand is because I have known when to say yes and when to say no. I've known when to say, yeah, I will model this or no, but I won't model that. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so when you identify, you know, what it is, your brand is whatever you're dealing with, whatever business you have, and you do, um, identify what that model needs to look like for you, then you strictly stick to that, right? You stick to that brand and making sure that it's clean. You know, making sure, you know, that there's not, and unfortunately, people, unfortunately, sometimes people fall for the okie doke and they make a decision in one minute that can mess up their brand for the rest of its entirety. So you mm -hmm. got to think like that. There are certain things that sometimes I've thought about doing. I said, uh, 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 no, ma'am, can't do it. It'll mess you up. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah. No, nah, that that that's real. That's real cool. Like it, it, uh, one of the things I've done in my in my past is I, you know, worked for directly for a CEO of, of a major company. And that was actually one of the lessons I learned from them. So that's resonating with me a lot was that you can't say yes to everything. Some things, you, you know, because he things proposals come across. I'm sure for you yeah. as well. Proposals come across your desk all day long. And it's yeah. like, sometimes you got to be like, well, no, nah, that's not what I do. Or I'm not an expert at that. Like, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that business is. So that's interesting. So that was one of the things I learned. I'm glad you were able to bring that out. One of the things, uh, this will be my last question as well. One of the things you talked about um, when we were when we uh, when you're talking to Corey is you talked about, which I thought was very interesting. You talked about your living and giving vision. So you had a, a vision for how you wanted to live, and you talked about a vision for how you wanted to give. So I just wanted to get into that a little bit more. What, what's your um? What are your what are your visions for that? Because this is a this show about generational wealth, and I think that's very important as for us to understand that we should have like living and giving visions. So, what's your your vision for living? And then, really so, for, important mm -hmm. to me, what's your what's your vision for um giving? Yeah, so my vision for living is me having the freedom to move and live how I want to live on a daily basis without having to second guess it. Like, so when I came on the show, I was sharing with him. You know, at first I was sharing with him. I just took my stuff out of the country you know, paid trip for them. We went to Cancun, Mexico, stayed four days, three nights, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't a second thought. They got massages, they did jet skis, they did parasailing, they ate what they wanted to eat, they drank what they wanted to drink. And I didn't have to think, okay, hold on, wait a minute now, what are the, you know, and I can hop out, my, they, my friends know I'll hop them and be like, yeah, I decide I'm going out of the country tomorrow. Like I'll just decide to go somewhere. I don't have to think about it. So that level of freedom for me, um, to be able to move how I want to move, go where I want to go, purchase whatever it is I want to purchase. That's the kind of lifestyle that I wanted to be able to have. And when it comes to giving, we're all God's people, right? So out of that, there should be a love. And so for me, you know, I have people who DM me, of course, because I'm on TV. Um, and so they follow me. I have mostly women who follow me. And sometimes they'll DM me and share with me something they may be going through. And I don't ask them a whole bunch of questions. My question is just simply, what's your cash app? Mm. And that's what I knew I wanted to be able to do. I knew that I wanted to be able, and I watched my mother be a giver all my life, you know? So I knew that I wanted to be able to have access 
to my money in a way where I can do that without second, you know, I don't care. And you'd be like, but you don't know if they tell the truth. I don't care if they're telling the truth. That's not for me to decide, right? If they're not telling the truth, God will handle that too. Like, I don't have to think or worry about that. But being able to know that anybody can call me at any moment and who are, who's in a place of need and know that I'm going to be there from family to friends to total strangers, being able to do that and move how my spirit moves me to move and not have to second think it, second guess it, that's the kind of giving I wanted to be able to do. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear it. I appreciate it. I'm trying to get to that level myself. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? so I Keep going. Keep yeah. going. Keep yeah. going. Yeah. Uh, hey, I got Huntsville in the house, Alabama A&M. You kind of quiet over there. You got any questions, Eric? I remember a while back when I moved from Florida back to Huntsville, uh, there was they were putting apartments in certain places like out of the blue. And you would wonder, why are they putting an apartment way out here outside the city where nothing is here? Mm-hmm. And, you know, come to find out, next thing you know, here comes this business. Here comes that business. Like you said, the Toyota plant. Uh, like, you know, things are different, Bridge Street and different things are popping up. So I would just, you know, when she said that, that would give me or let me kind of think of what she was referring to about just staying in the know of, you know, of what's coming on board. Uh, so, you know, where to invest, you know, your property, where to invest your money in. That's right. That's right. And all right. We're, we're okay, we'll see it at homecoming, too. Yeah, I usually skip out at home coming out. I'm telling you, I'll be too many folks coming in the city. I go into a whole nother city usually. <laughs> but the thing is, I was the same way when I was in college. When I was in college, I think I went to one homecoming when I was in college. <laughs> really? Yep. <laughs> wow, Eric, she telling me about Alabama and them y'all homecomings must be trash. She only went to one because you oh, know she done went to fam. Oh, you I went to your I went to, with you to fam. You homecoming and that was well. I ain't gonna say anything. I'm not. We'll talk about that off the air. No, nah, that was <laughs> and that it was all that. It was all that. Anyway, you know, I, I had to go. I had to get a little Alabama A and M back and forth real quick because I always get you every time. Every time. All right, Don, you have a question, sister. Hi, Melody. My name is Dawn Sassum. This is not a real estate question. This is a business question. So um, I have a business that I'm trying to aspire to do, but um, my biggest thing is marketing. What is your um, suggestion for marketing? Are there any marketing companies that you would suggest? So I actually do um, my own marketing myself. Um, What I will say is be innovative and creative when it comes to your marketing, right? So um, for example, I will tell you for me, I just recently started doing a bunch of skits pertaining to my skincare. People think it's entertaining. They think it's fun, but watch this. While they're watching something that's entertaining and fun, I'm also planting the seed of purchase my skincare in there, but I'm not just popping up saying, buy this. You get what I'm saying? So be innovative and creative with your marketing. Um, Facebook, Instagram, um, those are major keys. I use that a lot. I boost my posts and I do sponsored ads that way. Um, one of the keys, though, is knowing when you're going in there and you're putting that target audience in there. So knowing who's purchasing your products or your whatever you sell, right? Um, is it women? Is it men? What age group? Even all the way, they'll let you do all the way down to the states and the cities, right? So put that in there too. So you're definitely making sure that ad is hitting the social media profile of who is likely to buy your product. So I spend a lot of time narrowing that down. Since I'm on the show, I what I did, I reached out to OWN and I said, what are our 10 top cities for viewership? And now when I go in to boost my ads or my posts to do, you know, sponsored ads, I put those cities in there. Right. Um, And so but yes, word of mouth is also major, because if you're delivering a good product, you're delivering something that actually works. People are going to tell the next person. Um, I do use a texting. So when they go to my site, if you can do this, if you have a website, do a pop up where they can put their email and number in there so you can text them. I notice when I do send out a text, I use a, a company called Attentive, A-T-T-E-N-T-I-V-E, Attentive. And that's where we send out my mass text to everyone who's giving me their number, right? So when I'm running a sale, um, if I drop a new product, they all get this text to their phone and boy, do they run to their website, you know? Um, So that's also really good. Hey, how you doing? So my name is Bryant and I'm 19 years old. I have my realtor's license. I'm a licensed realtor in the metro Atlanta area. And I'm just uh, trying to figure out, I haven't been getting much business and I'm kind of struggling. So what can I do to better myself? 
Um, one of the things that you want to do, of course, being knowledgeable um, is key. But since you're a realtor, that means you're assigned to a brokerage or a firm. Um, look at your firm and see, you know, what the traffic is like for that particular brokerage. And if it's not giving what it needs to give, you may want to consider changing, you know, changing who your broker is. Mm -hmm. And also, um, if we want to contact you, how can we uh, contact you for your classes? Yeah, so I am actually on Instagram and Facebook. My username is Melody, M-E-L-O-D-Y, S-H-O-L-T. And if you're interested in my courses, it's masterclasswithmelody.com, masterclasswithmelody.com. And the next class starts September 11th. Is there a payment plan or anything if yes, you so can't afford it up yeah. front? Yes, we do offer shop pay on our website. And I want to say after pay is an option too. So they'll let you break it down into four or five payments. Great information. All right, Dr. Fuller, where you at, man? You have a awesome. question, brother? Thanks for having this amazing program. I think, um, you know, what Melody is talking about and what you all are talking about as well with generational wealth is the same thing that I'm focused in on with my nonprofit, which is uh, teaching kids financial literacy. Melody, with the adults, probably mainly 18 up is your core demographics. Uh, my wife does master classes as well around real estate and tax deed sales and things like that. But when you're talking about the youth, uh, what kind of things are you doing in regards to educating the next generation, like that that uh, group of young future millionaires that's maybe in that uh, 12 to 18 state, if anything? Yeah, so the only time I really interact, because I do know my target range and audience, right, um, outside of interacting with my own children who are, who are you know, have their own businesses as well, um, and they're 11, 10, 7, and 3. Um, but, you know, I get invited um, and I go speak at different, I was, we, I just took my children with me. We were in Michigan last weekend, um, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, so I do get booked to go speak places and sometimes there are, you know, youth there. And so then they get to interact and hear from me or sometimes they come to my performances. I'm a recording artist and they come up and talk to me then. So that's the interaction I get. Sometimes I have visited school. Um, sorry, this little thing is not holding up, but I visited schools as well um, where I've gone in, um, of course, with me having that education background from teaching middle school. I taught already for three and a half years in middle school. So sometimes I get invited to come speak at schools. This is just a, uh, you know, kudos to everything that you're doing. This is Thank amazing you. things sharing with um, the next generation. I can I can tell you, in, and even the current generation, I think the things that you're sharing now and pouring into adults they're going to be able to pour into their children, right? Absolutely. And everything is about what can you do to pour into others. So kudos to everything that you're doing. And I'll and give you, you too. A, yeah, yeah. I, I, and I've taught 20,000 kids, by the way, financial literacy. So that's kind uh -huh. of my, yeah, so like. And there the, you go. And that's your, that's what I tell people. You know your lane and you know your space and that's your, I love it. I love it. That's yeah. beautiful. And uh, kudos to everything that you're doing. Um, can't wait to, I, actually, I'm going to have my wife take your master class. But what you're doing uh, is something that she's doing another piece of the equation. But what you're doing is something different. And so I want to be able to share because we have, you know, just kind of a, as a one-off, we have access to 20,000 households with all of the families that we taught. And I would mm -hmm. love for parents of the students, right, that have been through my class to know a little bit more about your master class. And so there may be some opportunities for us to know. Oh, that'd be perfect. Absolutely. DM me. I check my DMs every day. Will do. <laughs> Thank right. you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Hi, my name is Shreya. I'm from Massachusetts. Hi. Hi, beautiful. Hi. Thank you. You're beautiful. Thank you. I appreciate Thank that. You. Um, so my question is, I, I had posted in the chat, but I might as well like to speak. Um, thank you so much for this. This was so much value. And um, so one thing that you mentioned was the was connecting to um your local um states or you know the commerce to connect and be in the know. That was beautiful information. I've even thought about that. That's my question really though is um for women who are in their 40s and also I'm divorced and or divorcing with children, I am an entrepreneur at heart and I find like um because teaching, I'm also an educator, I'm a teacher, and I think because it's so easy to fall back on doing that. And because being an entrepreneur, as you know, is so hard. 
And when you have so much weighing on you, you have to build paying things that you need to do. And just not only that, you just need to build a life. Um, what advice do you have for us to well, just... I yeah, I always say don't mix faith with foolishness, right? So you don't just, you know, it's good to have faith and take a leap, but you, like you said, you got bills to pay too. So you don't want to make a foolish decision. Just walk away from your nine to five and just, you know, I'm going to be a full-time entrepreneur. So I always mm -hmm. say don't mix faith with foolishness. But what I did, I literally taught and built my business at the same time. I was, I'll be honest, I was having 19 hour days every day for some months, but I was determined and I, saw what was going to come so I stuck with it you know what I'm saying um mm -hmm. was it tough at times absolutely but if you have a vision an idea business-wise that you want to focus on and you need to keep teaching as well do both until you get to a place when I realize you know what I'm doing pretty well over here with this property preservation thing and I saw what I was making with that and versus what I was making, only giving it, you know, a few hours because I was teaching every day. I was like, what if I start giving all my time because I'm already doing well, right? And so, but I didn't, that's when I resigned. But I didn't do that until I was at that place where my business was making money. Mm -hmm. So until then, I had to tough it up, stick it out. I was teaching, grading papers, making lesson plans, sending out work orders to contractors to go work during the day, closing out work orders at night invoicing the banks like I was doing all of that but I knew that as long as I stuck right there for a while that this was going to be something great and I would be able to walk away from teaching and that's what I did thank you beautiful beautiful yeah. and and also you were also teaching yourself the business side of everything as well yeah. as you were developing yeah. and building yeah, I didn't have a class like I teach. I have a class where I teach my students, but I didn't have a class. There wasn't no one teaching about property preservation. I just was up Googling a lot of times at night, reading and learning the game as I went. First off, Melanie, how are you enjoying Black Men Sundays? You enjoying your time on our oh, show? Oh, I am. This is awesome. I think it's great. Thank you. All right. All right. One more. Then I'm out to Iris in the mic again. I am so impressed with you as a woman, Black woman sharing all this vital information that people need desperately, okay? Dr. Fuller, I know you're somewhere around there. Dr. Fuller's my guy. My daughter took his class and she's, she's got money now. I have to borrow money from her. Yay. But anyway, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I've been in real estate for a long time. I have properties in Chicago, Charlotte, Dallas. And I try to explain things to people for free. But you got to have desire, drive, and ambition to want to do this stuff. That's the stuff you can't put into people. You got a very, very uh, great program that you can share with people. And if they want it, you can't give it to them for free. Because if you give it to them for free, then it, it has no value to them. Yeah. But when, when someone has to pay for something, then they feel like they have the necessity of at least trying to learn it. Right. Okay. So um, hats off to you. Continue doing what you're doing. Um, whoever the, the guys run the program, this is the first time I've ever heard of uh, what Black Men Sundays. Mm -hmm. that, that's the name um, of it. Yeah, yeah, man, you got you got to get on with the click, baby, because we're doing this like this is a movie. Well, you know what? So you need to get Dr. on. We Fuller, sent me some Dr. shows <laughs> in, bro. Doc, Doctor Fuller sent me a link, and when he sends something, he's like E. F. Hutton. Everybody listens. So. Basically, I just plugged into this thing and after listening to it for a while, I say, this is good. There are so many people that need this so bad. And they're wondering what to do, what direction to go in. There's no shortcuts to success. You got to put the time in, okay? Blood, sweat, and tears. And then you will get results over time. It's not going to happen overnight. Overnight, no. Mm -mm. You know, so what you're doing, continue to do it. Continue to do it. There's so many people that need what you have. It's unbelievable. So I'm so proud of you. God bless you. Thank you. you continue Thank you. to continue that good work. I'm in Charlotte. Thank so you. There's opportunities everywhere. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. So keep That's up the good work, sweetie. And Thank uh, you. and melody, right? Uh huh. Melody, yes. Like, like you singing a song, huh? That's right. <laughs> You're singing a song of success. Thank you. With a lot of brothers and sisters, you know, we get married. I'm married. You know, a lot of brothers on here are married. And, you know, we don't think about divorce and all that. You know, we enjoying life. We trying to 
lay roots down. But, you know, one thing about generational wealth is we're trying to build businesses together. We're trying to, you know, make sure that our household is set up. But then when something happens and the household is broken, what do you have to put in place financially to make sure that when the union is broken, that the finances don't really create too much of an issue? So um, for me, in my situation, um, we dissolved everything. And um, for me, I always say if he did it before, he can do it again. And so just like, you know, God made me a millionaire before I was going to be made one again. And I believed in that and I stood fast in that and I worked my butt off again the same way I worked it off before to get back to that status, you know. Um, And so unfortunately, you know, most people, when we get married, we're not thinking about divorce. We're expecting to be with this person forever. But sometimes things happen. The biggest thing I will say is when things happen, if that if divorce ends up being the end result, you can't lay down and give up. You got to keep grinding. And I know if you have children. So for me, you know, I have four children. When I walked away, my baby was three months old. And um, I knew that I wanted them to still have the life that they had been accustomed to because when they came into the picture when I had our first daughter we were already sole entrepreneurs so all they've known is mommy and daddy being entrepreneurs and working for themselves and um you know being able to travel and go and all of this and so when the divorce happened I'd be doggone if my kids was gonna it's gonna experience a different type of living because their parents didn't work out So then my grind became even harder. It became even more important. And one of the things that I talk about a lot is legacy, right? Legacy, legacy. What do you want when your name is in the history books? What is it that you want to be written about you when you're no longer here? Who do you want being attached to you when they draw your picture and they got lines going everywhere in terms of who is attached to you? That's important, right? That's legacy. And so I had no choice but to keep going and grinding because I knew my kids weren't about to suffer a lifestyle change because their lifestyle changed. Definitely. Well, Melody, Cherie, thanks for coming on Black Men Sundays. Your wealth of knowledge was, I mean, awesome. I'm gonna thank have to. You. I'm, I I'm appreciate to... it. Your hospitality has been amazing. Thank, so you. thank you. Well, you well, you know, I'm from New York, lived in Virginia, but I've been down in Florida where the Southern hospitality really kicked in. So uh-huh. I definitely appreciate it. I'm gonna have to send Ivan a bottle of Ace of Spade or something because this was this was a great show. Thanks for all your well the knowledge. Thanks for your information. Like I tell everybody, you could have been anywhere in the world, but you came on Black Men Sundays and blessed the stage. So thank you yeah. for your time and thanks for coming on our show, sister. Thank- Thank you. Y'all have an amazing Sunday. Love y'all and keep y'all heads up and stay encouraged and keep pushing towards the mark of the prize of the high calling, okay? It's a black man Sunday. Time to put all childish things away.